Good afternoon. Welcome to the JB Font channel. I am your host, James Fauntleroy. So good to see all of you here on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. The JB Font channel is available on all major podcast platforms like Anchor, Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. So let's go ahead and subscribe to me there. Also part of the Revolutionary Blackout Network. So you can see me typically on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. And typically you can always see me on my channel on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Thank you so very much to all of you joining me here today. If you guys have not, then you guys can also subscribe to my Substack for email notifications, even though the email notifications weren't as accurate as it should have been today because I had some technical difficulties and other things. But if you guys would like, you guys can go to jbfont.substack.com. Thank you for so much for bearing with me. And God, you guys are have patience like a saint. So thank you so very much. Also, if you would like to contribute and assist with the help of having supporting the channel you guys can go to patreon patreon or coffee or you can guys can become members thank you so very much to all of you who have so far but without you guys i would not be able to do this i just appreciate you guys for supporting this channel from the top and bottom of my heart why am i late look let me tell you something I look Linda and I, Linda Linda is the computer all right the one you're watching me that I'm using that that's Linda Linda and I have had a a bit of a a, 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 of a scuffle today number one number two my dumbass decided okay I'm doing the reading today for lazy does not exist right and I what did the you know labor organizing summit yesterday I'm, i was still exhausted right so by the time two o'clock hit i was like all right you know what i read i you know i did all my pre-reading and everything i was like you know what i'm gonna take a short 20 minute nap so at two o'clock i set my clock for 2 30 p.m i literally did it on my phone by the time I wake up, it's almost 3.30. I'm like, what in the hell happened? Turns out I set the time, but I didn't turn it on. And so I was like, okay, okay, I can fix this. So I set the stream up for 3.45, thinking I'm going to be ready. As soon as I come in to get everything started and pop in, just like I do as always, Linda decided to act up. So now here we are, an hour after I wanted to be live. And now <laughs> I'm I'm late. So thank you so much for being patient. I had to just get that out to y'all. And plus, I'm frustrated right now. But hey, I'm here. Good to see all of you as well. We got Miguel in the chat. <laughs> it's in high. Miguel's like, what's going on? right and then listen linda okay 
So what are we going to be talking about today? Today is uh, the reading day. We're going to be doing a reading live of Laziness Does Not Exist by Dr. Devon Price. And this chapter, we're going to be doing chapter three, part one. Now, as far as in as far as in lieu of having the labor organizing summit that we had yesterday, which was great. We had a lot of great information in that labor organizing summit. Actually, Dr. Devon Price actually goes into labor in this chapter. And this is actually really interesting. And the reason why I say it's so interesting is because it taught the top the top the chapter is entitled you deserve to work less this is so interesting and this starts on page number 73 and you know i'm just going to give you guys a couple of the subheadings it says we're working more than ever before so going to go into that and then you can only work so much so this is actually going to go into our our relation to production. And this is going to be so you're going to be thinking to yourself, wow, this is very true. And you're just going to this is going to be a cathartic. Uh, this the whole book has been cathartic, but this chapter, the beginning of this chapter is going to be even more cathartic for you. So I can't wait to get into it. So I hope you guys got your tea. I got mine. Let's begin. You deserve to work less. Work less. Dr. Annette Toller is an industrial organizational psychologist. Her research focuses on how changes to the workplace influence how people feel and behave. For years, she conducted studies on a variety of topics related to how employees are managed in this country and how management decisions impact pro productivity and well-being. Her work has examined questions such as whether a manager can be trained to be more charismatic. They can. Whether the size of a teacher's salary is related to how well their students do in school. It is. And whether people in healthy relationships make better employees than people in unhealthy relationships. They do. And that's expertise is vast. Her work has appeared in some of the most prestigious academic journals in her field. And for many years, she was a tenured professor at DePaul University, just down the street from me in Chicago. But one day, she decided to leave it all behind for a more authentic, joy-filled life. And that was at the height of her career when she decided to leave her cushy tenure position for less consistent, less secure work as a freelance writer and consultant. For many, this would have been a terrifyingly risky move, but for her, the path was clear. After decades of studying what makes a workplace healthy, and conversely, what can make a workplace toxic, Annette could tell her academic department was leaning more and more to the toxic side. Once I got tenure, I felt pressure to start bullying people below me, Annette says. Faculty and would bully students in my department and senior faculty will bully junior faculty it was just expected for you to be part of that and that noticed that faculty and students in her department were stressed out and overextended there was a great deal of pressure to perform at high levels at all times without breaks or a time for rest and reflection people tend to monitor and judge the behavior and productivity of others. Burned out, miserable faculty members offloaded their stress onto others below them. Just stopping there really quick. That's interesting because you know what? We will be at work and we'll see somebody that may not work as hard as us. And we'll go, well, that person is not doing as much as they as we are. They're not carrying, they're not carrying their weight. But at the same time, you know, we're literally judging the productivity of others. Kind of interesting how we suddenly become kind of the lackeys of management in a sense. It's like, well, they're not pulling their own weight, they're not being responsible. It's interesting. And then on top of it, 
Um, you know, we tend to, you know, we tend to take off steam, blow off steam on others, especially if we're in a uh, vertical organization, the people below us, we tend to take off our steam on them. So it's, yeah, it's really interesting. Burned out, miserable faculty members offloaded their stress on those below them. There was an overall climate of bitterness and cynicism. In short, Annette's office was far like too many offices in America, almost perfectly designed to create traumatized, exhausted people. Since Annette had personally studied the toll that such workplaces can have on their employees, she knew she needed to get out. I pretty much gave up on the profession after that, she tells me. Today, Annette lives a life that her own research would recommend. She finds time for marathon runs and for making art. She's working on a mystery novel and volunteers rarely to support survivors of domestic violence. And although she has a lot of freelance work to do, she deliberately puts other things first, including making time to be interviewed by me. I prioritize the things that and invest my time and interest what matters to me, Annette says. And that's what the psychological literature says a person should do. So, you know, I could be working on some deadline I'm worried about that is ultimately arbitrary, or I could be doing what I want to be doing, which is talking to you. And that has an easygoing, open perspective on life. She has carved out an existence for herself that lets those wonderful qualities shine. But she was able to build that kind of existence only because she had the privilege and knowledge to avoid what was bad for her, the conventional, restrictive, overly demanding workplace, right? And some of us do not have that privilege. And I, and I appreciate that Dr. Price actually acknowledges this because a lot of times when we talk about the issue of uh, trying to get out of this uh, laziness lie, what happens is some people in certain professional spaces are able to do this. But those of us who are workers or working poor, we do not possess the luxury of doing that as much because if we don't, we risk homelessness, we risk hunger, we risk not being able to have school, we risk and so on and so forth versus those who are in a more PMC or professional managerial class are able to kind of shun this a little bit and walk away. And because of that, they're able to choose a more healthier option. The healthier option, the healthier choice is not on the table for a lot of working and working poor people. So that's something that we don't have the luxury of. And so unfortunately, that's something that we have to try to mitigate around work. See what I mean? Let's continue. Many organizations have been shaped by the history and values of the laziness lie, often with disastrous results. The typical workday is structured around the expectation that a person should be able to sit down and churn out results for eight hours or more, despite overwhelming evidence that this is unrealistic. Managers often believe they must micromanage their employees and attempt to squeeze out every last moment of productivity out of them. Though research suggests this makes people irritable and unmotivated. Overworked employees are often encouraged to police one another's habits and to spread their shared misery throughout a department, creating a contagion of unwellness and bad boundaries. Remember when I said sometimes you know, you see your coworker and they're not doing as much as you. And you're like, God, they're not, they're not pulling their weight. When in reality, maybe you need to ease up on yours. Because if they're able to pull less weight, right? And they're still 
hired. They're still working. They're not being fired. <laughs> right? Ease up. Don't push them to do more, especially if it doesn't necessarily affect their pay. Don't push them to do more. You do less. You chill. See, they want you to do the reverse. They want you to intensify your labor, and they want you to intensify your co-workers' labor. No, nah, baby. Worker solidarity. If you see your worker can do less without ever having to be fired for it or without having to be pulled into the office for it, then shoot. Especially if you're not getting a living wage, man, act your wage. Act your wage. Be cautious when you act your wage. Because a lot of times, you know, they'll see you go on a certain trend and then they'll expect that. So when you start a job, you do the minimum that you can. Don't give them, don't give them all that. No, don't pull it out like that. Mm -mm. No. Under promise and don't over deliver. That's that's what you do. Basically. Thanks to the development of digital work tools, the pressure to be available and useful to an employer at any time of day has only grown. And our shared sense of exhaustion and burnout has gotten more and more intense. Though many of us feel feel guilty for not being productive enough. The truth is that most of us are doing far more work than is healthy. We're pushing our bodies and minds to the limit, ignoring the natural warning signs of tiredness and laziness and encouraging others to do the same. I work 80 hours a week. You guys complained about 40 hours. You guys are just a bunch of wusses. You guys are lazy. I did 80 hours a week. When in reality, you're basically going up against the victims by being proud of being more victimized, more exploited. Interesting. Interesting. When we push ourselves in that way for a prolonged period, we risk suffering from severe fatigue and burnout. If we want to break free from these damaging patterns, we need to embrace our very human needs and our natural laziness signals and find ways to work less, not more. Man, I'm telling you, we're about to go into our... right we're working more than ever before this is going to get interesting y'all in chapter one i discussed how our collective fear and hatred of laziness has its roots in the history of slavery and capitalism true stuff i also described how laziness lie was used to justify pushing industrial era workers into grueling 16 hour day work days filled with danger and abuse Unfortunately, this historical legacy remains very relevant today. Though there was a time when the average work week kept getting shorter and shorter in length, thanks to a large part of unions and the labor movement, that pattern has sadly reversed in recent years. This is the point. The average workday is getting longer now, not shorter. We see the pressure to overwork in nearly every industry and professional field. Smart smartphones, laptops like Linda, <laughs> and digital work tools such as email and Slack have made it harder than ever for us to leave our work behind when we go home for the day. And thanks to the rise of the gig economy, the pressure to fill even our spare moments with additional labor and side hustles has expanded our workloads even 
more. How many people are going to after work to work and drive for Uber or for DoorDash just to make ends meet? How many people are doing that? Side hustles are the norm now. But that's because of the system. We got to a point where we were working less and less and less and less and less. And guess what? The corporate dictators saw that. They were like, oh, hell no. You guys are going to be working more and more. You got. We want you to make bricks with straw, without straw. And so now we're working more and more and more. We, we got child labor coming back. It's called coming back. Keep an eye on this space. The work week is getting longer. The Industrial Revolution brought with it the rise of the industrial warehouse-based workplace. Factory employees were toiling all day in dangerous, dark conditions, unable to make time for anything in their lives other than sleep. There were very few legal protections in place for employees, and many were given no compensation if they got injured on the job. Abuse of employees was rampant, with not many even being uh, given a lunch hour or bathroom breaks. An hour-long lunch is... I Wait, have I ever had the privilege of having an hour-long lunch standard at my job? No. Now I think about it, no. All lunch breaks for 30 minutes. In elementary and middle and high school, we got 45 minutes. Almost an hour. And yet, as an adult, you got 30 minutes. Legally, two 15-minute breaks. But if I like, for instance, when I was cooking in the kitchen, you couldn't take a 15 minute break if we were busy. If we were getting slammed, you couldn't just tell the chef, hey, I need to take a 15 minute break while you got a rail of tickets going. Like, no, you can't afford to do that. We'll be going behind our ticket times. So, yeah which means it will make a longer wait for food in the restaurant. So, yeah, it's very rare for a lot of Americans to have an hour long break. We just don't get it. We only get 30 minutes. That's it. Workers began banding together and staging walkouts, demonstrations, and strikes <laughs> in order to protest how they were being treated. Remember the, the labor summit yesterday? Remember, you know, a lot of things are going on now this summer? This went on for years. It was intensely and violently resisted by employers, as well as police and U.S. military. Yes. Eventually, though, the labor movement began winning legal ballot battles and unions were invited to the negotiating table. Slowly but surely, employees earned the right to more benefits, greater legal protections, and work days that were punishingly le work days that were less punishingly long. For decades afterwards, there was an overall trend in the US towards shorter work days, greater pay, and more benefits. Through the mid 20th century, many working class people enjoyed newfound levels of comfort and wealth. Millennials like me and me grew up hearing about this era from our parents and grandparents. I know it, for example, as the time period that allowed my Appalachian grandparents to make the move from the impoverished Cumberland Gap region of Tennessee up to the middle class Cleveland suburb where I got to grow up. It was a time of high economic prosperity in the U.S., particularly for white and white passing people like most of my relatives. See, here's the thing. It wasn't that big of an opportunity for people who look like me. So this is not only 
a class thing. It's also a race thing. See? When you look at people who are overworked, who maintained that overwork, black people carried a big chunk of it. Right? That era, however, is long gone. In the past two decades, the average work week has gotten longer and longer instead of getting shorter as it once did. By 2014, the average American work week had crept up from 40 hours to over 47. In a survey conducted by Gallup in 2018, 44% of respondents said that they worked more than 45 hours per week. Of that 44%, 12% reported working 60 or more hours per week. That's 12 hours of work per day. While at least 134 other countries have placed legal limits on how many hours a person is permitted to work. In the U.S., there is no legal maximum. So the length of the work week can continue climbing up and up. In some organizations, working overtime isn't even viewed as an extra push of effort. Instead, it is considered a weekly obligation. When my friend Eli took a job with the massive Silicon Valley tech company last year, they were dismayed to learn that every employee in their department was pre-approved for 10 overtime hours every single week. This alone made Eli hesitant to take the job. Were these extra 10 hours really overtime if they were regularly expected? In the past few decades, employees have also found a variety of ways to cram greater productivity into each hour they work. Thanks to digital tools, automation, increased computer processing speed, and a ton of other factors, it is now it now takes an average worker just 11 hours to complete what they would, would have been 40 hours worth of work back in 1950. So, it only takes us now 11 hours to do the work that it took 40 hours to do back in 1950. We quadrupled the speed of our production. Quadrupled. Everything is four times faster. Like, if your page is loading on your computer and if it takes more than 10 seconds, you start going, what the heck is going on? Whereas back then, you needed about a good 30 seconds for your computer to load, for your page to load. And this is like 20 years ago. Now it's just boom, instant. And our brains now expect it to be instant. Interesting. Yet despite how much more people are working and how much more output they are generating, wages have declined over the years instead of going up. Hmm. In addition to the working more hours, employees today report higher levels of stress than recent generations did, particularly stress associated with job duties and poor management. Pensions and health insurance have also been affected in many industries, either being removed entirely or made far less generous than they were a decade or more ago. Many companies have moved towards relying on part-time employees instead of full-timers so they don't have to offer benefits. In a very real way, many of us are working far more and more, producti and pro more productively than ever before, and yet we're getting far, far less in return. So this is just, whew, wow. So let's continue. We can't leave work at work. This is a good one. My, my teeth. Mm. 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 
Though Annette has lived in the U.S. and studied American workplaces for many years, she's originally from England. She noticed that compared to Europeans, Americans have particularly dysfunctional relationship to work. When Europeans go to work, they just do their job and then they come home, she says. And they understand about the importance of relaxation, that balance that you don't always see in the United States. It's true that Americans tend to have the trouble of drawing from firm boundaries between work and the rest of our lives, compared to Europeans who often have upward of 20 paid vacation days per year. This is true because I used to work in the entertainment industry, but not entertainment industry, tourist industry, and we would have Europeans and they would say, oh yeah, we're, we're here for a month. A month? Yeah. We're on... And we're on holiday for a month. On holiday for a month. Like, what? It's unheard of. But for them, it's typical. Sometimes they'll vacation in places like Italy or France. Just take the train. Boom. Over there. compared to Europeans who have op often have upward of 20 paid vacation days per year, American employees are luckily if they get 10 to 14. Wait. I never really took a true paid vacation. No, not really. Mm -mm, no, never. The laziness lie has also infected numerous American employees with a strong sense of vacation guilt, which makes it hard for us to feel comfortable actually using those vacation days up. A survey by Glassdoor found that in 2018, Americans used only about half of their paid vacation days and let the remainder go completely to waste. We have similarly tortured relationship to sick days Almost half of all working Americans don't have paid days off for physical or mental wellness. And those who do are hesitant to use them. Like Max, whose boss manipulated her into not calling in sick, many of us fear that taking time off will make us look lazy, unreliable workers. Yeah. Like, for instance... Just like not having many vacations at all, or none really, I didn't have sick days. Not paid sick days. And you can't call in, you know. And the thing is that because you don't have paid sick days, calling in sick is a risk because then if you call in sick, you don't get paid for that day, which means that your paycheck will be less. Which can affect your rents and your electricity electric utilities your food bill in fact a lot of things like max you see i'm sorry and we're not paranoid for having that fear in 2019 american airlines was sued by new york city's department of consumer and work protections for having punished and threatened workers who used their sick days when companies fail to provide employees with adequate sick leave policies and managers bully their workers into working while ill, the public health consequences are massive. Many sick employees spread the C-19, the pandemic, I have to be careful how I say it, to their co-workers and fellow commuters because they weren't able to take time off from work in the early days of the pandemic. On a more mundane level, Sick food service employees often have no choice but to come in to work and spread their illnesses to fellow workers and patrons. 81% of food industry workers have no employer provided sick days. I had to go into work as a line cook, sick, with a cold, with a communicable disease, and work because I didn't have sick days. 
here I was making your wings, making your quesadilla, making your penne pasta, or I was making your bruschetta salad while sick. And we ain't have masks that plen uh, that plentiful back then. To walk around with a mask was seen as weird. So if I was sick, you got some of my germs. That's right. I've been subjected to this too because I didn't have sick days and I couldn't take the day off. That's why I pause because I identify with this so much because it literally happened to me multiple times. Multiple times. And I felt bad going into work. And I even told my managers that I was sick. But we had to do what we had to do. So if somebody caught what I had, even though I wore gloves, wash my hands, but you're still breathing. That's the way it was, man. And it still happens. Mm -mm -mm. When people do get the chance to leave their workplaces, they still struggle with the temptations to continue working remotely. Email, Slack, Twitter, and other applications make many workplaces accept accessible at all times. And as a result, work seeps into all hours of the day. Researchers call this work home interference. And since smartphones and other tools have become widely accessible, it's gotten much, much worse. 36% of survey respondents told Gallup that they frequently check work email outside of regular work hours and in organizations where people feel the social pressure to be available online all the time, the work home interference rate is much worse. One overworked person that I spoke to, Nimisire, Sire, is a sex health advocate and educator based in Nigeria. She tells me that she has to place a firm digital boundary on her activism for the sake of her well-being. I do a lot of online education and advocacy, she says, and it can be very exhausting. I have to mute certain words on Twitter, words about sexual trauma or objectification, for example. And sometimes I put my phone away. Educating people is part of my job, but I have to trust that I can set a limit on how I do that and know that I will still be doing work that's important. So this is a good example for activists as well, because sometimes we'll bring our work home. Hell, technically, I'm still sick and I'm working right now. <laughs> Goodness. Many people don't share Nimisire's level of discipline. We get pulled into an endless loop of replying to messages, checking for new notifications, and doing unpaid work long after time in the office is done. With the rise of things like the gig economy, the work-life interference has become an even more pressing problem. Alex works full-time at his administrative assistant in the Chicago Loop. All day long, he edits documents, takes meeting notes, makes copies, and runs errands. During rare moments of quiet in the office, Alex tries to catch up on creative projects. He's an actor and a performer, so there are always new lines for him to memorize and new aud auditions to try to book. At the end of an already long crammed workday, Alex gets home and fires up the website Upwork to look for some jobs as a copywriter or a transcriptionist. I end up doing these transcription work more often than the writing even though it pays less, Alex says. It just takes less energy to do it. I can, can kind of just zone out and write the words down, even if I feel like a zombie. 
when taking Upwork's fees and time spent finding new clients into account, Alex's transcription job pays much less than minimum wage. But it's better than nothing, he says, and it allows him to squeeze a few more hours of earning potential out of his day. You know, it's funny. A lot of times when you talk about wanting to turn a living uh, minimum wage into a living wage, a lot of people will say, well, it's better than nothing, right? Technically, yeah. But at the same time, what good is it if you're not earning a living wage? It's like, yeah, I have a job, but I'm still homeless and living in my car. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense. Like, you should be able to earn a living wage, but at the same time, you can't. And you have to push yourself despite that. A lot of us have turned to sites like Upwork, TaskRabbit, Uber, Lyft, Fiverr, or Grubhub in order to make a supplementary income. After all, full-time jobs with benefits are rapidly becoming a thing of the past. The harder it gets to make a conventional 9 to 5 living, the more people have to fill their weekends, evenings, and other spare moments with money-making side hustles like these. And it means that you are, if you're spending time on this, you're not spending time with your family, your friends, even just spending time with yourself. You don't have that time. You don't have that time to be with your kids. You don't have that time to be with your partner. You don't have that time to catch up with friends. You don't. You miss these moments. You miss living. That's what happens. Because these corporate dictators say, your life belongs to me. I know more people like Alex than I can ever possibly name. The gig economy has arrived in full force and it swallowed up the free time and brain space of every driven millennial artist I know. Ricky drives for Uber in the mornings and evenings when he's not busy giving singing lessons and performing in choirs. Dio used app WAG to find work as a dog walker, supplementing the income he made as an ice cream shop manager. I used to edit people's academic papers for about $20 an hour on Upwork until I got too busy to fit the side hustle into my life anymore. I still feel the urge to get on these, uh, get on there sometimes and convert my free time into profit source. So many of us have been pushed over the edge. Our economy is structured around the hatred of laziness, and it has us working longer and longer hours with each passing year. Most of us don't know how to walk away from our jobs, whether for vacation, a sick day, or simply to relax at home at the end of a shift. Apps like Foxtrot, Upwork, TaskRabbit, and Uber beckons us to work even in our spare time to tempt us to set even more strenuous and unsustainable goals. All this intense overcommitment and overwork is ultimately self-defeating and harmful. In truth, a person can only work so much. It's crazy. You know what this makes me think about? This makes me think about the billionaires, right? People are like, oh, my God, they work so hard. The thing is that they don't work hard is that they put the hard work on others and exploit them. But they lie to us and say that they, they, they exploit themselves in order to get that much output. But the funny thing is when we do that, when we exploit ourselves to get that much output, we're not making millions and billions. It's because they lied. And they'll put out books and say, well, if you guys want to have that millionaire mindset, you got to get up at five, four, four o'clock in the morning. You got to get up at five o'clock in the morning. You have to read four books a day, right? You got to you gotta have this millionaire mindset and do all these things. Basically, you got to beat yourself against the wall in order to get like them. When in reality, they didn't get there that way. 
most of them already have the money because of mommy and daddy. You can't tell, you cannot sit here and tell me, oh, well, Elon Musk got that millionaire mindset when he literally inherited money from his daddy because he dad, his daddy owned an emerald mine. And that emerald mine was using exploited labor from South African workers. So did he really build himself up to that? Hell no. Millionaire mindset, my ass. It's just exploitation. If you know how to exploit people, then yeah, you can become a millionaire. But you have to have... You have to have that breakdown of ethics and immorality within yourself in order to do it. You have to have this morally repugnant nature within you in order to do that. And fortunately, most of the world, we don't believe in that. That's why we are the ones that get exploited, not the other way around. You can only work so much. Human beings are not robots. I'm going to repeat that. Human beings are not robots. We can't keep churning out consistent results for hours and hours. In fact, we can't maintain consistent output for more than a couple of hours per day. People often find this startling to learn, but it's really true. We're not made to work for a full eight hours per day, despite that being considered the reasonable, humane work length, workday length in much of the world. Though there's a great deal of social pressure and cultural programming that says otherwise, being productive and effective at work is not a simple act of will and determination. To do good work, a person has to reset and find moments to enjoy the beauty of life. More hours of work does not equal greater productivity. That's because our attention and willpower have limitations and quality work requires time for rest. Working longer hours does not mean more productivity. Henry Ford found that when he cut his employees' hours from 48 hours per week to 40, productivity actually increased. This discovery of Ford dub, sorry, this discovery of Ford's dovetailed perfectly with the labor rights movement, which was pushing for shorter work weeks for the sake of workers' well-being. Over the next two decades, the 40-hour work week became more and more common in a variety of industries until eventually it was the American norm. What happens when we work more than 40 hours per week? We get very stressed out, but we don't get a whole lot more work done. The more a person works past that 40-hour limit, the less efficient and accurate they seem to be at their job. Past the 50-hour point, a person's productivity declines very sharply. Past the 55-hour point, and a person is so unproductive <coughs> excuse me, and tired that they might as well not be at work at all. Additionally, the longer a person's work week is, the more likely they are to be absent from work in the weeks to come. That's always a warning sign of employee stress, absenteeism, and that says, if people stop coming to work suddenly, that's often an early sign that something is wrong. So there are good reasons for why the standard work week became 40 hours. Anything beyond that seems to sap an employee's strength and yield diminishing returns to their employer. But these standards were developed during the Industrial Revolution when people were doing <clears throat> excuse me, repetitive manual labor work. Are these numbers even still relevant today when most people work is done by a machine or most people's jobs are complex and mentally taxing? Industrial organizational psychologists like Annette have observed how employees work and organize their days. 
They found that the eight-hour workday is, in fact, unrealistic in many ways. Many workers spend upward of eight hours per day in their workplaces, but when we look closer at their activities, we see that the lion's share of that time isn't devoted to work. Researchers constantly find that in office jobs, people are capable of being productive for only about three hours per day on average. The remaining hours are spent doing other things, including preparing food and drinks, chit-chatting with co-workers, browsing social media, engaging in online shopping, or even just staring into space. Like Mitch McConnell when he quiet quit it. When managers attempt to make up for this supposedly lazy time by requiring their employees to work longer hours, it actually backfires and employees do even less. When employers and even some researchers discuss these trends and employee and discuss these trends, they tend to frame it in terms of time that has been lost or wasted. Or they track their brains, they wrap their brains rather figuring out how to motivate people to work harder. But before you let the laziness lie tempt you into accepting that, think back to Marvin's research into cyber loafing. Remember, we talked about that. When we talk about idle time as being a waste, it implies that people are capable of working nonstop for a full eight hours. If only they have more willpower. But after periods of hard work and focus, people need time for rest. The employee laziness that so many managers fret about patently does not exist. Those distracted, idle seeming employees are already doing all they can. A major reason for that has to do with how the human brain handles attention. Boy, boy, and I'm telling you, this is interesting. It talks about, you know, really, it's not a waste. It's just employees taking those mental breaks that they need in order to stay productive. Our attention is limited. I've taught college students for a decade at this point, so I know how hard it is to hold someone's attention. My students are mature, seasoned adults who are returning to college. They're committed, driven people who have a lot of the tenacity that laziness lie has taught all of us to praise. Yet even among these students, maintaining attention is a major struggle. Education researchers have known for many decades that the average student cannot pay attention for more than an hour or so without a break. Anyone who leads a class on a regular basis will tell you that they have to use a variety of tools, media, and and activities to keep a room full of students focused. Even if a professor does everything they can to do, they can to keep the class lively, attentiveness still declines slowly over time. When I work to design my own online classes, I learned that students typically keep their attention fixed on the video for only about six minutes. Wake up! Wait! Hey! 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 You guys paying attention? <laughs> you guys see? You guys see me now? You guys aren't glossed over. <laughs> Oh, goodness. If the video is any longer than that, distraction sets in whether the student wants it or not. (laughs) In the workplace, patterns are similar. Workers have trouble staying on task for more than 20 minutes at a time. And the more distractions, such as email, ambient noise, instant messages they have to deal with, the shorter their attention span is. 
It has nothing to do with willpower or laziness. Instead, it has everything to do with how the human brain fundamentally works. One of the first psychology-related jobs was in a neuroscience lab. One of my first psychology-related jobs was in a neuroscience lab at the Ohio State University. My boss at the time, a researcher named Jay Van Bevel, showed me data from participants who had been sitting in an FMRI, functional magnetic, <sighs> functional magnetic Renaissance machine imaging brain scanner for an hour or more. He described to me how their attention levels curved up and down many times per minute with tons of experiment time lost to distraction, daydreaming, and mental fatigue. These participants have been instructed to pay close attention throughout the entire experiment. But even then, their attention naturally flitted about from moment to moment. It turns out that even when we think we're focusing on something quite intently, our attention is jumping around a bit, even on the millisecond level. Jay told me that these peaks and valleys were pretty much inevitable, no matter what the researchers did to keep participants engaged. Just like even watching me right now and listening to me right now, some of you, your attention diverted for a few seconds and then came back to me. And that's just natural, right? It has happened to you guys during this entire stream. It happens whenever you guys watch other people. It happens when you guys are at work. It happens when you guys are at school. Because that's just the naturally how humans are. And Dr. Devon Price is going to get into it a little further. Rather than dismissing those study participants as horribly lazy, researchers simply knew that the data had to be clean and filtered. Jay's study participants weren't they dreaming or checking out of his studies because they were lazy or even distracted. There's not much to do or look at when you're sitting inside of a dark gray fMRI machine. Attention fluctuates naturally because human the human brain is constantly scanning the environment for new information, potential threats, opportunities for social contact, and more. Even when we're intently working on something, part of our attention is tracking our surroundings, ready to interrupt us if any distractions or threats happen to pop up. Our attention is less like a laser beam, which can be pointed at any single specific point where we desire, and more like a rotating lighthouse lantern, temporarily bathing individual rocks in light as it continues to spin across its surroundings. So basically, instead of being like this with our attention span, we're like this. Scanning surroundings. Potential threat. Averted. Scanning potential surroundings. Averted. We're just like that. That's how we are. Since our attention is so naturally scattered, focusing on something requires us to exert some serious effort. That effort can't be sustained forever, which is a big part of why most workers need lots of time to be lazy. It is important that we make time for idle chit chat, dwindling at, sorry, dawdling at the water cooler and daydreaming at our workstations, particularly if we want to engage, engage in high quality work. The more we overextend ourselves, the worse our work gets. Quality work that requires time for rest. When we work too hard and for too long, the quality of our work starts to break down. We become more irritable and easily distracted by things like random background noise. Like, uh, <laughs> we get sloppier and more prone to errors, whether they're as simple and low stakes as making more typos or as catastrophic as a doctor making a mistake in the middle of a surgery. Tiredness even makes us more apathetic about doing our jobs in the right way. We get sloppy. A study in the Journal of Applied Psychology found that when healthcare workers 
such as doctors and nurses, are exhausted from working long shifts. They lose the motivation to follow basic hygiene rules and cut back on how often they wash their hands. Because you're no longer doing the happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, you know what I mean? You're not taking the time, the precaution that it needs in order to stay as safe as you would. You just try to quickly go through it because you're just trying to get to the next task. A survey of 450 call center employees found that the more tired and overwhelmed an employee became, the more they tended to withdraw emotionally from their jobs and the less likely they were to show up for work. Work fatigue also kills creativity. In the previous chapter, I described how creative insight requires a period of incubation, a restful break that allows the creative mind to unconsciously come up with new ideas and solutions. The flip side of the incubation phenomenon is also true. When people don't get access to breaks and lazy time, they think in more conventional, uncreative ways and are more likely to get stuck. This, think about this politically. Think about this when it comes to our needs. People get stuck in thinking, oh my God. Capitalism is the only system that we have because you're so tired that you can, can't even think beyond capitalism. Oh, my God. Yo, when I, when I read that part, I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. That makes so much sense. We're too tired to think. The corporate dictators have made it in this country that you and I were too tired to even think outside the box. Because we don't have time to sit idle and let our brains process things. So then when we talk about something outside of capitalism, you get people going, uh, what? No, there's no system outside of capitalism. That's the way humans have always done it. When capitalism's only existed for about 500 years, humans have been in existence for over 100,000 years. Capitalism, this much of human existence. That's it. It's like what the quote says. A person can't... A person can imagine the end of the world before they can imagine the end of capitalism. We just, They're making it so that we can't think about it. If the climate is right, and that says people will be proactive and suggest new things that nobody's ever tried before. But when there is more of the micromanagement approach, people will just go along and comply. And you don't see the same level of commitment. When organizations try to force their employees to work harder than is good for them, lackluster, uncreative work, tends to result. The subreddit, Malicious Compliance, is filled with stories of jaded employees who follow their employer's rules in a super literal fashion, slowing down workplace processes out of spite. Right, I've done that. For example, underpaid, overworked, mentally checked out security staff might slow down admission to an event by asking every patron to empty out every single pocket in their clothing, even obviously decorative pockets on small children's clothing. When Serenine was in the military, her commanding officer once tried to discipline her by demanding that she write an essay that was exactly 1,000 words long on any topic of her choosing. Within an hour, Serenine returned a paper covered in random looking symbols, but which Microsoft Word recognized as exactly 1,000 words. 
when her commanding officer asked her what the topic of this essay was supposed to be, she simply said, following directions. Often, the work of exhausted employer, employees suffers for reasons other than simple resentment. Tired people also think in more biased ways. Focusing on negatives, making more unfair judgments. I'm going to read this again just so that we can put a fine point on this. Tired people also think in more biased ways, focusing on negatives and making more unfair judgments. Think of the political climate. Think of our climate when it comes to people considering our the way in which we focus our world, the mode of production, how we formulate society. Think about it. And now think about all the people who are working more and more and having less time to actually rest not just their bodies, but their minds. An employee working for the ninth or 10th hour of the day is a ghost of the up, upbeat, focused, and engaged person they were in the first hour of the day. All this research makes it abundantly clear that the more we work, the less we're able to accomplish and the less unique and meaningful our work becomes. An overly long, excessive, demanding work that erodes a person's capacity to think well, to care about what they're doing, and to produce meaningful results. And that's just what happens to the employee's output. When we examine how work impacts an employee's well-being and long-term health, the story becomes far more disturbing. And that's the end of part one. This is wild, right? Wild. The next subheading we're going to cover next time is what happens when we overwork. We're going to be covering that next time. I cannot wait to get into that part. But it's just, it's just, it's no wonder. No wonder. People are, and also think about this. People are more dogmatic in their views in a lot of ways when it comes to actually talking and going over disagreements people are less likely to actually discuss their disagreements and try to hash out where one person may be wrong or they may have a blind spot they're just like no this is what i think and i don't want to hear it to, from anybody else and that's it because they're so exhausted that they don't actually have the brain capacity they don't have what we like to call the bandwidth in order to hone in on maybe something that they may be wrong or maybe need to be readjusted in because they're tired. And so this is why it's important for us to give people the grace in order to learn, to be patient with people, it's not fair sometimes, especially when you belong to a marginalized group. It's not fair. But at the same time, it could also mean that once they do learn, we're at least one person closer to changing the system. So this is why it's important for us to be patient, including with people that we love. Because the people that we love are tired. And you don't think it's not happening to kids? Kids are exhausted, man. Hell, look at the high school and look at the system. When it comes to school, especially high school, high schoolers are not meant to be up that late. They're not. Not late, that early. Their circadian rhythm is off. So yeah, it just goes to show where you know we have to we have to take into account the human condition and how we operate and show that 
when it comes to productivity, we can only do so much. There's like this, there's a sweet spot that we have, but because of the greed of the corporate dictators, they want us to go beyond that. But they think that if we go beyond that, then we're still going to stay the same. So here's what happens. It's really just a bell curve. It's like by the time you hit three three hours, that's your height. After that, it starts it starts descending. And so you may hit this after three hours, then you go four, five, six, seven, eight, but then they want you to work longer, nine, 10, 11, 12. You know what I'm saying? And so guess what? You are exhausted. You have nothing left to give. And the thing is, is that at the height, you are doing great. And that's what they, they, they expect you to continue to be at that height. Also, let's think about this. When it comes to these people at the top, the CEOs and the owners of the means of production, they're not working that much. They're able to take time to rest their brains. And so then when they come into work, they're great. They're happy. They're, they're like, hey, because they have a monopoly on time. They have a monopoly on being able to reset and center themselves and actually be fresh and energized, ready to go. Whereas you do not have that monopoly. You do not have that privilege. And they assume in their heads, oh, I, I, I work hard and, you know, I you know, I do all these things. You should be able to do it too. It's like, no, I'm cleaning the toilets for 60 hours a week. I don't have time to take breaks and think like you do. And you may say, think that you work all the time, but in reality, you really don't. All right. So let me go to the chat really quick. Thank you so much to J H S. J oh say J J H Scott six. Thanks for taking the time to these readings. Thank you so very much. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm so appreciative of this book. It's amazing. Um greetings to Sokudo. Thank you so very much for coming in. Good to see you. All right. Good to see you. Kilia Grigor says, this is a great book. Yeah, it is an amazing book. I, I highly recommend you guys uh, get this book. Gamer for Life is in the chat. Says, I know I'm late, but I just came back with my dad from the laundry. Well, I hope you got that nice April fresh smell in your clothes. Oh, look, I love that. I want to bury my face in my clothes after I wash them. Real, real talk. <laughs> flush says i definitely have my feet kicked up as much as possible at work yeah look kick your feet and next time you go into work kick your feet up for me too do it <laughs> oh my goodness i was late today too John to Emily, good to see you also as well in the chat. Let me see, make sure. Okay. Sean Miller says, it's terrible to push people beyond their mental and physical limits. I have walked off many jobs because of that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. J8 Scott 6 says, thanks, Miguel. I should have. Oh, <laughs> you were talking about proofreading. Cobra Commander says, I mean, I've been getting ready to go swimming this whole time. My distraction from this stream has been, I wish my kids didn't blow up this alligator before we got in the car. <laughs> oh, gosh, that's funny. Yeah, that's all good. Sean Miller says, JB, if you have kids, there is no, I'm tired, leave me alone. 
companies don't give an F. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. And you know what? I should. I watched Office Space a long time ago. I barely remember it. Maybe I should re watch it again, rewatch it. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so the thing is that we have to get to a point where we realize that it is not good for us as workers to go beyond what our capacity is and also realize that not everybody has the exact same capacity. Some people, they may be able to go for a little bit longer. Some of us may need a little bit more break time, but that's okay. And the thing is, is that when you look at a lot of cultures, especially indigenous cultures, they didn't work that hard. They did a lot of chilling. Number one, they let the earth work for them when it came for food. Number two, they really didn't have to be as protective as other cultures. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the funny thing is, uh, people will talk about how they didn't have, you know, armor and stuff like that. You know, when it came to productivity, I'm sorry, when it came to uh, their cultures, they didn't really wear a lot of protective things, but because they didn't really need to. Because uh, and somebody was explaining it, somebody indigenous was explaining this, how in Europe they actually have less resources for farming and have less resources. So they're always have because of those lack of resources, they would have to take from each other in order to obtain those resources to survive. Right. And so because they had to take from each other, they had to build up technology in order to defend from others taking from them, meaning armor, then also firearms and guns and muskets and things like this. Whereas a lot of the global South, which the a lot of indigenous cultures were, we had farming, we had agriculture, we had all these things, and we were able to provide for ourselves without having to war on each other to take each other's resources. So because of that, there was no need to develop this technology to protect ourselves. So by then, yeah, we were walking around in loincloths and, and sarongs and we were just chilling. And in fact, a lot of indigenous cultures didn't even have, you know, a lot of dangerous weapons against themselves. The, we the weapons that they had were really against wild animals. If they had disagreements, they they beat each other with sticks, you know, but not to the point of death. It was just to, you know, it was almost like a uh, just like a fight or a competition. But you walked away. You know what I mean? So the thing is that when it comes to indigenous cultures, they really didn't need to. But yeah, so I got to get going. Um I'm hungry. And ooh. Sabby's laugh. I gotta go. Anywho, guys, thank you so very much. If you guys have not, then you guys can also uh get email notifications. You guys go to jadefont.substat.com for those notifications. Thank you so very much for tuning in. As well as thank you so much to patrons on Patreon, Coffee, as well as members. And thank you to all the people who sent me super chats because that also matters too. Thank you so very much. If you guys would like to, you guys can always go and support the channel in that way. Or if you guys would like to, you guys can go to the description and go to various platforms to send me some type of mutual aid as well. I accept those also from the top and bottom of my heart. So thank you. So thank you for coming in and tuning in for laziness does not exist. And thank special shout out and thank you to Dr. Devon Price for this book. I cannot wait to get into this next part of the chapter. But in the next part of the chapter, uh, we'll be starting at page 87. So be sure to join in for me on that. And like I always say, water your plants, water yourselves, leave the world better than you found it. Reading is fundamental and always make sure... If you can, because I know some of us can.
try to do less so that your body can recover, your body and your mind can recover as best as you possibly can. And do not be afraid to ask for help because that's capitalistic thinking too. That's individualistic. I can do it all on my own. No, we can't. We're human beings, not robots. Ask for assistance because that's what humans do. Anyway, forehead kisses. Love you for watching. Happy Sunday.